All right, it is time to bring up our featured speaker. Today we have with us Pete Machek Potts, and Pete, uh, she has a nice, long, lengthy bio in your yellow program. Um, if you'd like to read it, I will spare you doing that. Um, but just a bit about her. She is a meditation teacher, uh, an ordained minister of I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it, all right? I, I had this before we came up here, like, because I'm newly out of uh, very hardcore evangelical Christianity, and so I know nothing about Buddhism. I'm like, if you if you read through this, there are all sorts of words. I have no idea how to pronounce it. Um, all right, but she is a meditation teacher and an ordained minister of Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva, I was so close. All right, Bodhisattva Buddhism. All right, she is a member of a thriving song that, I got that one right. All right, <laughs> uh, thriving song that at the Temple Buddhist Center in Kansas City on the plaza, and is on the board of directors of the Inner Peace Buddhist Center. But when I asked Pete to describe herself, um, she said that uh, uh, she's a non-theist, just like uh, a number of us, and that she is a regular middle-aged lady trying to do something good. Um, so you would welcome, with much love, Pete Potts. Well, thanks so much for having me here. It's really great to see so many people here. Um, here to listen to just little old me, some middle-aged white lady out here on the prairie, as I said, just trying to do something good. And that's really all I consider myself to be. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to start with um, just talking a little bit about who I am as a Buddhist. Um, since I am a Midwesterner, I was born and raised in Iowa, so clearly, yeah, go Iowa, woo! Um, so clearly I was not born a Buddhist or raised a Buddhist. Um, I was um, born and raised a Lutheran. Lutheran? Okay. Lutheran. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I say I was, um, Raised a dark German Lutheran, meaning um, you sat in church, you took your lumps, and you liked it. And if you were suffering, you were probably doing something right. So that's yeah, Catholics, yeah, Catholic life. There was a, there was an argument in my church. I remember when I was young, whether or not we were going to get kneelers, and we com compromised by the first four rows of kneelers. So, <laughs> so I was not raised a Buddhist, and uh, but I. Uh, Began studying Buddhism um, probably, you know, when I left home and I went to college and started exploring and um, did what a lot of people do, read a lot of books. Um, when the internet came along, I'm old enough to remember life before the internet. Um, that gave me the chance to explore and do a lot more things. Um, and then I met the Sangha here. So I've been practicing for, you know, seriously for about 10 years. Um, and I love that one of your tenets here is that um, people are more important than beliefs. And one of the things that we say at the temple uh, when we're talking about what we believe is we talk about, you know, the teachings of the Buddha, and that's called the Dharma. Dharma is like what the Buddha taught. It's the ultimate natural um, universal truth. That's called Dharma. And we'll talk about how you can read it in a book, and you can sit around and talk about it, and Buddhists are guilty of this awfully, because most of us have a big stack of books, and we bought them, and we're gonna read them, and they get dusty, and, um, but we say that it's more important to have the direct experience of it. You can talk about it, you can read about it, but you actually have to have the direct experience of what it means to interact with other people, and that, Behavior is more important than beliefs. And we say that every Sunday in both Dharma talks and just about every time we have a group gathered. So we are very symbiotic um, with you people here at Oasis. Um, and who I am personally, as I said, born and raised in Iowa, um, went to grad school at OSU. Um, I am here practicing prairie dharma um, with a full conviction that I can be um, an authentic Buddhist without 
pretending that I'm Tibetan or Japanese because I'm not. I am a 40-something-ish um, white lady living in Kansas um, in 2016, and I can be an authentic Buddhist doing that. So, um, so how did someone like me get into prison dharma? So, uh, I've never been in jail or prison. I don't have any family members that have ever been in jail or prison, and I don't have any friends, I don't know anybody. And uh, so that's normal for me. But what happened was, uh, at the temple we watched, we have a, a movie night every now and then, and we watched a documentary called Dhamma Brothers, the Dhamma Brothers. I don't know if anybody's seen this documentary. If you haven't, I really recommend it. I checked it out beforehand. It's not on Netflix and it's not on um, uh, Amazon Prime, but I know there's lots of documentary places out there. I'm sure you can go stream it somewhere. It's called the Dhamma Brothers. And it is about a group, a small group of uh, meditation teachers who took this into a prison down in, I think it was Alabama, and it's a 10-day retreat format where you go in and it's, it's a structured um, format where you go in and there's silent retreat for 10 days and you're meditating all day, every day. And these people were, in a, they were separated and um, so this retreat follows the people that um, participated in this and uh, what their experiences were and how it changed them. And I remember sitting, um, much like you were sitting where you are, watching this, and I knew as soon as I watched that, two things. One, I would, myself was going to go on a Vipassana retreat. I knew that was inevitable. It was something I was going to have to do. And two, I was going to do prison dharma work. Neither of these things particularly appealed to me at the time. <laughs> um, but there was something in me that knew that this was a challenge that I was going to rise to. And um, so I did that. So there are a number of, um, it's called Vipassana. Um, you don't need to remember the name, but it's just, it's the kind of meditation that you do. And the way that it's um, structured is that um, you essentially are, it's, it's, it's 10 days long, and you're getting up at, I think it starts at 4.35 in the morning. And, not a morning person. 4.30 in the morning is, for me, the middle of the night. But I did it. Uh, and you're meditating for essentially 10 to 12 hours a day for 10 days. And uh, miraculously, I survived that. And I made a little documentary about that, which I will send the link if anybody's interested in watching that. Um, I cheated a little bit in that um, you, you are not supposed to have, you, you don't read. Um, you don't have your cell phone, um, you don't write, you just are alone with your mind and how it works and you watch it change and all these things. But I did make little index cards and I recorded myself, so I cheated just a little bit. So I completed this retreat and then um, came back and maybe about a year later there was someone else in the Sangha who, um, Sangha is our term for congregation, group, whatever, and she, this was her passion, was um, work with corrections and um, reentry. So, um, as you heard, my Buddhist name is Machik, and I got that from my teacher, who gave that to me when I took some bodhisattva vows. And Machik, is my namesake. She was the first female um, lineage holder in Tibet. She was 11th century um, female Tibetan teacher. And she has, she had five very short teachings that she taught over and over and over again. And these are the five teachings. One, be brutally honest about yourself at all times. Two, approach what you find repulsive. Thank you for your, um, Presentation. That helped me do that. <laughs> Three, help those you think you can't or that you don't want to. Four, anything you're attached to, let it go. 
And five, go to the places that scare you. So when I got this name, uh, I took these teachings very seriously. And one of the places that scares me is prison. Because I watch TV, I watch the movies, it's scary. So we had a meeting, and first meeting, lots of people were interested. We had, the room was packed. We had like 35 people show up, and a lot of people um, interested in talking about it. And when it came time to actually fill out the applications and talked about uh, scheduling and how often we would go, then we had like 10 people actually filling out the paperwork. And then we had six people actually go to the training. So this is what it looks like now. So right now, we go to Lansing, um, to the, to the um, state prison in Lansing. And there are three um, custody levels in Lansing, minimum, medium, and max. And each religion has a time every week where they can meet. It's called a call out and they get two hours once a week where they can meet. Christians and um, Buddhists and uh, Muslims and Asatrians. Asatrians are people who um, uh, worship um, Odin. Odin, they're in their Norse religion. Uh, <clears throat> and they meet every week. And currently we meet with every custody level twice a month, so that's six meetings a month that we go. And in minimum, we have about six guys. Medium, we have a, a really big group. We have 25 to 30 guys. And in maximum, um, it's dwindling because those guys are moving up to medium, which is great. That's what we want. Um, we're down to like four or five guys there. Um, we also previously were at Crossroads in Cameron, which if we have time, I will tell you a story about that. Um, and we are also um, taking our training at the end of March. Um, uh, three of us are going to be uh, volunteering at the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Leavenworth. So that's kind of encompasses what we're doing right now. And um, we're also teaching a six week Basics of Buddhism class. And um, that will end in two weeks and it's an amazing class. Um, and at the end, they can take their official refuge vows. A lot of them feel like that's when they've officially become a Buddhist, even though there's not really any sort of conversion to become a Buddhist, but um, it's very, very meaningful for them. Um, and then I personally also am a, I guess what they would call a visiting clergy for um, a young man who is in the Johnson County Detention Center. Um, his mom reached out when he was committed, and um, he's still awaiting either trial or sentencing, and um, he's really desperately needed support. So I have been there um, visiting him on a regular basis as well. So, um, so I'm going to tell you about the my first time experience going there. So remember how I told you that we talk a lot about how it's it's the direct experience. It's not enough to talk about it or read about it. You have to actually do it. You have to put your foot on the path and go. So up until the point where the first time I went, I had been talking about it, reading about it. <laughs> and my tendency is if, if I'm anxious or have trepidation, I gather as much information as I can. Google the hell out of it. And so, you know, I, there's all, there's, there's other sorts of um, prison um, drama programs um, across the country. But none of it's gonna tell me exactly what I'm supposed to, you know, what I should expect. So I had this expectation and I was with three other people and I wasn't convinced and I, made, I let them know, listen, I'm just gonna go, I'm not making any commitments, let's just see how this goes. So we went in and I mean my eyes were, uh, you know, like half dollar 
exercise. I was aware of everything at all times. I took the training, and they, they scare the crap out of you at the training. They try to, you know, they give you all the worst case scenarios of what could happen, and who's gonna try to manipulate you, and who's gonna try to get you to be their mule, and all kinds of stuff that they try to tell you. And um, so we went in, and you go through the metal detector, and take your shoes off, and all your rigmarole, and first thing I notice is the guy doesn't even look at when the stuff goes through. He doesn't even look at the screen to see what's going through. Okay. Sign in, get your stamp on your, your little invisible stamp on your hand, and take a deep breath, and the door opens, and you walk down the hall, and I hear that door shut behind me. Okay. Okay, I can do this. I got people with me, and it's how bad. Is this gonna be? So you walk down the hall, go a ways, and you can you look out to my right, and there I can see the yard. Real life, but not on TV. This is real. Real yard. The guys are out there with waves. I can see, you know, the the razor wire glinting prettily in the sun. And uh, you know, I tend to be an anxious person in new situations, so my heart's pounding and sweating come to the end of the hall, and this is Lansing. This prison is over 100 years old. So you come to the end of the hall, and someone sees you press the button, the big old door rolls, you walk through, and you have to wait, and then the big old door, clang, it shuts behind you. Okay, that's another door between me, and in case something happens, it's another door shutting me in. There's one more door between me and this entire prison population. So then you just show your ID, show your invisible. Take a breath. Okay, open the door, walk out, make sure it's shut. And there, we're out. We're out, it's a big open space. We walk down the stairs. And my first thought is, where are the guards? Where, where's my armed guard? Where's my armed guard? Does, any, does, does everybody know I'm here? And, am I doing this like someone watching me with a gun ready just in case? That was my thought. That's what I expected in a way. I did not expect that I was just gonna just walk in and, and the people walk out, walk toward me and we were just gonna walk in and it was, it was crazy to me. So I quickly, to make it short, is we came in, I met them, we sat down, and I soon found myself in a room full of men in for homicide, in for rape, in for aggravated robbery, all with our eyes closed, meditating. I opened my eyes just to see, are these guys faking it? Are they, are they just trying to impress me? No, they are earnestly sitting in this meditation, looking for answers. And I realized that this prison work, it's like, it's, like a, it's like a pointillist painting. You know, from a distance, those kind of paintings, you see the overall picture of things. But as you start to approach, you see all, you start to see the individual dots that make up the big picture. And as you keep getting closer, you start to see each individual dot. Each, even each dot has little different colors in it and then a little different size and shape. And eventually you're close enough that it's just the dot. You don't even see the entire picture. And I found that as a volunteer, the ability to paint with a fine brush instead of a roller is crucial. That the charges that these people, these men came in with, is not define who they are. Just like the shittiest thing I've ever done doesn't define who I am. Things that I've done, um, especially when I was young, that kicked off a series of unfortunate events doesn't define who I am. 
But they're there aspiring to commit to good compassion, to wisdom, to skillful actions. Nobody goes in prison a Buddhist, trust me. Nobody goes in prison a Buddhist. And in fact, coming to our call-outs um, set them apart. It wasn't easy for them to do that. Um, but I did want to read this one thing to you. So we had um, one guy in a call-out. He was sort of like the um, patriarch. So he was a guy that the other, other guys looked up to. He'd been there for 25 years. Um, he was a leader of the Buddhist call-out. He had a very um, long and deep practice in meditation and Buddhism. And he got out, and he's someone that I've stayed in touch with. He's down in Texas now. He's got a job. He's going to college. And as I started working with this inmate in the Johnson County Jail, who's on the very beginning, he hasn't been sentenced, he hasn't had a trial, that's a very different thing for me to work with as well. And I asked him, what can I tell this person about what to expect, how to be? And um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this to you. This is, this is we, we text and we talk on the phone. So uh, this is exactly what you text me and I, I wanna read this to you. <clears throat> he said, this experience is gonna hurt but it will be worse if you try to avoid the pain. The bad things you've heard about and seen on TV, the threats and taunts, mostly that's all they are, just words. The ego self must die. It's a target for others to strike. I'll tell you what I did. My practice was to look at myself in the mirror and call myself every nasty name I could think of. I would look at myself as I allowed these words to land in my heart and I just owned it. I faced it. I told myself, this is who you are. This is your label. And refused to let myself hide. You can't escape it. I did it over and over until the words lost meaning and impact. And in this way, I took away a powerful weapon. There was no longer a reaction to those words which kept me from flinching when people spat them at me. It kept me out of conflicts. I owned who I was and what I'd done so no one could scare me with it. You are letting go of your self-image, the one you had in the life before prison. You'll let go of the beliefs about yourself. What you knew and the world you knew will pass away when that gap drops. It can crush you or it can remake you. Accept the crush, the dying of the self, and use it as a crucible to extinguish the ego. There's immense power in acceptance. This is how things are right now. This fate is inescapable. You must accept it. There's still happiness to be found. There's still friendship, beauty, and hope. I promise you, my friend. Forgive yourself and learn to love yourself for who you are, not what you have done. Be regretful, but not shameful. Shame will poison the rest of your life. Find peace, because no one else can do it for you. And so throughout the time I spent in my work with my Dharma brothers in prison, I find it matters less which side of the bars you're on, and more that you do find the courage to go to the places that scare you because often it's there that you'll find that you, you'll find what you need the most. Thinking 
I know what this is going to be. I've seen Oz. I know what this is going to be like. Okay? It's not, it's not like Oz. Um, the show or the, the imaginary place. Um, now, again, I will say, one, we're in a religious call-out, so clearly I'm not living there, and two, I'm in a Buddhist call-out. I, we are constantly reminding each other that a Buddhist call-out is in no way a cross-section of the prison population, that's for sure. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, the, the, the TV and the movies, the, the typical dis depiction of prisons is absolutely not what I found. No, not, not even when I'm walking, you know, right straight through the yard and I don't, we don't get cat calls and that's a lot, but I mean, it's just not, it's not what it's, it's not what it's like on TV and movies. Anyway, oh, here. How would you say, how would you say prison affects people's lives after they get out? After they get out? Yeah. With or without it? With or without? Uh, the rehabilitation. Yeah. So, it's no secret to you guys, that's a really big social issue, is re-entry. Um, there are some nonprofits, not enough. Um, there are some um, government-sponsored um, programs, not enough. It's really hard. 25% of the uh, inmates that get out of prison are homeless because they might have been in prison for a long time. People fade away, people go away, so they have no support. They don't have the ability to get a job. They don't have any money. They don't have any family or support. How, what are they supposed to do? So it, it's, it's a really big issue and it's, it's hard and there are, is not even nearly enough support in order to be able to reintegrate those people um, back into being productive, to not, to not living the rest of their lives as a label um, for something they did, you know, 35 years ago or more. That's a good point, thanks for bringing it up. Do you have any information on recidivism rates for prisoners who receive Buddhist teachings? That's a great question. Since Buddhism, um, there has not been a very long history of uh, volunteers going in um, to the Buddhist call out. We don't have enough of a history. I can tell you that um, we have started tracking. You can um, keep track of uh, how many DRs they get, disciplinary reports. So right now, anecdotally, we we have actually two guys that we're having DR after DR after DR. I mean, like, like you can go on the on um, their page and you can see the list. Like you can scroll way down. And now it's like two and three months between where before it was weekly. Of course, we're going to take credit for that, and of course, the prison administration will take credit for that, you know. Um, but I will tell you, in Kansas, the overall three-year recidivism rate is about 35%. That's average. 35% over three years recidivism of the general population. Not cloistered 
and, and monastic. So we are very much about um, householders practicing. And so um, the Bodhisattva vows include things like um, one of my biggest challenges in the five Bodhisattva vows are looking for and acknowledging the good in others. So that goes anywhere from you know, a guy in prison to maybe somebody I'm related to. <laughs> Looking for and acknowledging the good in others. Um, uh, about being generous um, in all ways, you know, with money and time and spirit and things like that. Um, not being attached, those sorts of things. So Bodhisattva, Bodhi is awakened, and Sattva means um, a being. So a bodhisattva is someone who um, works on waking themselves up so that they can then go out, just like you, you guys talk about, um, what is it you say, um, good works are done by human hands or help people with... Human pain. hands solve human problems. Thank you, yeah. That's, that's very similar to the um, bodhisattva sentiment that we have, that if you're gonna help yourself, it's so that you can help other people. That's exactly what our Bodhisattva Buddhism means. Yeah. How does the uh, principle of not being attached, how does that play out in a world where more than likely you own a car, you have children, house, how does that work out in the day to day? So it's okay to have those things if you have them. Um, but it's about the attachment to them. If, if they own you, then you're attached. You know, you can own them, but if you realize these things come and go, um, you have a new car, but at some point your 17 year old's gonna take it and wreck it. Uh, and you're not gonna get bent out of shape because your identity is wrapped up in that car, and then you're gonna holler at the 17 year old and, and cause all sorts of psychic whatever that's going on, um, then that's what it's about. You know, we have these possessions, and we have a house, and, and we're grateful and thankful, but we know these things come and go. And so having them is not the problem. It's about if your attachment to them causes you to do things that are not skillful, to exclude other people, um, to say and do things that are not skillful. That's the problem. Yeah. All right. We have one, we're going to take one more question. You have a microphone here. Yeah, I can't, I can't hear you. I'm not sure it's on. There. Hi. Okay, so my first question is, what prompted you to join the Buddhism community? And um, what did you take away from being in uh, the prison population? Um, so like I said, I've been reading Buddhist books, and I've been actually meditating off and on and doing yoga for a number of years. And then I would feel better, and then I would go out and try other things. and then. It all face plant and I would come back and do it again. And uh, I joined the Sangha here because uh, I was at a face plant point in my life. Um, I have a panic disorder and things were just kind of really, really shitty in my life. <laughs> and I needed more than a book or you know a website could give me. And uh, so I needed to step it up and pick it up. And so I reached out and connected with them and I found um, that aspect of the practice added so much. So that's how I ended up connecting with that. And as far as, I'm really glad you asked that about what I find in, my, in the prison dharma. Sometimes when I leave, and they're so grateful, and they'll say things like, make sure you drive, you know, make sure you drive safe when you get home, you know, when you drive home, say things like to me just feel this little twinge in my heart because I don't think they understand how much I get from being around them. I've decided in my practice with them, and not everybody who does this work does the same as I do, 
But I decided that when I was working with them, I wanted to know about their background. Because I felt for me, that was gonna stretch me to be able to hold certain things that I know and to hold, here's who you are right now. That deepened my practice for me. And to see these guys, and to hear their stories, and to, to continually get closer and closer to that painting and see all those little dots is just, it, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing experience for me, and one I completely did not anticipate. That first day I walked in, I, I expected to be like, nope, not for me, and never come back and have a reasonable excuse why I felt that way. And within 20 minutes, I knew that this was where I needed to be, where I wanted to be. And there is such a feeling of privilege to be the person who's holding this space where I might be the only person that's called them by their given birth name in a month. They get called, you know, their presumptive name or whatever, but they haven't heard their name James in years. Or a space where they can be vulnerable. They can talk about fears. They can talk about some of that's sadness. There's a lot of that. They can't talk about that anywhere else. So to be honored, to be the person that's holding the space where they can do that is just beyond, beyond anything I could have ever predicted. And so whatever I may bring to them, I feel is I'm rewarded with tenfold. Thank you for asking. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.